Well, thank you. I'm glad to be here with you all this morning. Uh, what year did you graduate from Marshall now? I was teaching there in 92 to 94. 92 to 94, toward the end of that there. And I was, from y'all's age on up, my entire life, I have been in the agriculture industry, farming and ranching out here on the southeast part of Berry County, which is Brian and the Calaveras Lake out there is where I grew up and uh, started. So I've been involved in agriculture my entire life. And um, I'm going to present a bunch of things to you all. And I'm, I'm sure you all are interested in this here because it, it's a big change in industry. Uh, I hear from time to time, you know, that old dumb farmer or whatever. Uh, folks, I've never met a dumb farmer in my life. So I'm getting close to it. But to make a living and entirely on their own and to do their things and to, to have a commodity that we all can consume and eat without any fear of any contaminants, it to me is, is just an awesome thing. There's a lots of countries around that yes, we better be concerned on what we're eating because they utilize some chemicals and things to keep the insects off and, and uh, natures like that that would kind of scare me. You know, we, we all hear about organic gardening now and there's organic farming and et cetera. Well, that, that's good, but uh, you know, the, we have it that without the term organic, we can still produce a lot of commodities because, you know, this whole world is really growing. I don't know how many more billion people we're supposed to have in the next, uh, I think, 15 years. And they, they don't know right now how we're going to get this commodity. And we're fixing to go through a bunch of these on selective breeding. And I'm even going to touch just a little bit on, on GMOs, that ge genetically modified, that y'all hear a lot about. And I'm going to give you a different perspective than what I read always because... Uh, I'm just going to wait till I get to that point. I don't want to spoil it right now. But on selective breeding throughout the whole years, uh, we've come a long ways, and we've got a long ways to go yet. Because if we're going to feed another billion people, and they're not making any more land that's good enough to raise crops on, what do we got to do? We've got to selectively improve on what we're producing so we can feed all of our future kin folks and whatever in this world. Because a billion people takes a lot of food. And I can go back, when we started, let's say back to Aztec Indians. You know, what part of the country that were they in? Are the Incas? What were the Incas in all of those? You guys from Texas history, hmm? you, you studied this. Yeah. Where, where did we first start? You know, if you get down to Mexico, uh, they start uh, and on your corn varieties here. Many, many years ago, back... Whew, like I said, in the Indian ancestry down in Mexico, this is what our corn looked like here. This little version's here. How many of y'all seen corn growing in the field or in the garden? Popcorn or any type of corn? What do y'all consume when y'all eat corn? What part of the plant are y'all actually eating? What do they call it? Hmm? What's this here? The ear of corn's what they call it. That's an ear. And yes, sir, very good. And, and that ear of corn... You know, we started off on what we call the tassel. The tassel is the male part of the plant. You know, it takes two to tangle, the males and the females, and that's what we have on bulls and cows and rams and ewes and et cetera. It takes two in the, uh, in the animal and plant world to, to go ahead and pollinate. And you come in here on the tassel, that's where they, they had a little bit of kernel, that's all they had. They'd kind of strip it off like grass seed. We can go out through the, our pastures here now on top of the old dry grass and strip those grass seeds off. I've watched turkeys strip that off before. Just strip that off to their beak before they can eat. Well, that's all they had to eat. You didn't get much. Look at that big old ear over here that we have nowadays. Man, y'all go and just, y'all can chow down on that and really eat. We can feed probably a, not even a fraction of a person to maybe two people if you had to survive on a day on that ear. Through selection over the years for different reasons, we have come from this plant right here where we get a little bit of green on the end to where we get an ear that grows right off the stalk now. It grows right off the stalk. And through selective breeding, we have several varieties of this corn that will produce multiple ears. I mean nice multiple ears. Usually on the same amount of fertilizer and, and water. And we come in, so that's what you're looking for through selective. This old Indian was out there probably walking around and he had his rows of crops and the, all the hard problems they had of watering in them days, their little canal. And he would come up with one that would have, you know, maybe three times the amount of seed for some reason. 
he doesn't know, maybe there's a little extra fertilizer. That fish might have been a little bit bigger than that other fish that they were fertilizing with. Y'all all heard that story right in the old days. That was their fertilizer because when that, an animal body decomposes, it gets into the ground. That's organic matter. That's organic fertilizer when that animal decomposes down in that body. So uh, that's one thing, you know, through selected breeding. He saved those seeds. He didn't eat them that year. He said, I'm sure like the way that plant looks there. So he went ahead and he saved those plants and replanted them next year. And he you know, took an exceptional person in. We're not all agronomists and in here and maybe love plants and that, but that one person, whoever started that stuff, uh, started selecting this and he would plant. And through generation after generation, he kept the best and would store that and keep it away from the creatures that didn't need it and replant. That's selective breeding. And he got improvements each year until all of a sudden, off the tassel part, when you got in the garden down that corner, it has a tassel. That's the male pollen grains up there. That's all your male pollen grains. And we come down here to this ear of corn now that's growing. It has what coming out of it? Anybody know? Silk. Silk is what comes out of the end of that corn cob. They call it silk. Very fine, little string-like stuff. You can eat it, it doesn't hurt you, whatever. It's unusually cleaned off before you consume it. And so they go ahead and uh, each one of those silk that comes out of that corn is the female parts of the plant. As this pollen nowadays bursts open, it comes, falls down to the ground, and as it's falling down, it lands on that silk. If you come in and put a bag on top of that corn ear and no pollen grain hits it, what's going to be on that cob? Nothing. You won't have any corn at all. So this farmers in the old days, after they started getting a few ears that, mul that come got bigger and got down on the stalk, uh, they do a technique now to where we call selective breeding again. There are students up in Indiana, Illinois, a lot of them smaller country schools up there, 4-H kids and FA kids, their summer job, they can't wait each summer. They come actually pick them up for bus, these Monsanto and these other big grain companies, and they pick them up and they go out to that field and they give them little brown, you know, what y'all would call a lunch bag, the little bags, common bags, and those students walk up and down them rows covering ears. And what's the purpose of that? They don't want this pollen to fall down on that. Well, they'll go to another field a few days later and they'll cut that tassel off. They know when this is just right and they'll come along and shake it, take that bag off and shake it on there and cover it back up. And what just happens when they shake that pollen on there and it falls onto that silk? We're developing two select strains to produce hopefully a better ear. <coughs> and the bigger the ear, the more grains we're gonna have. And that's what we gotta have through complete selection. We're always trying to go ahead and get better stuff. Any questions on that so far? How many of y'all like to eat corn? Corn on the cob or sweet corn or whole kernel corn? It's, it's a pretty stable item. It is grown in every state in the United States and almost every country in the world now. Corn. It's one of the very, very unique crops. We can't say that about rice or milo. I seen you uh, advertising on TV the last few weeks. Uh, what's the one? on red, they're comparing it to all our blueberries and all of that, good for the, oh, berry? what is it, berry something? Acacia something? berry? Acacia berry, well that's just model or maize, we've been raising that for ever since I was a kid out here, and we've been shipping, I don't know, India's been using it for generations for flour, but we're finally starting to use it for some of the varieties for flour, because they're finding out now through selection, we have altered that berry or maize enough to where it has a better, uh, usable fat content that, that we can consume. But corn through selective breeding and, and watching years after years and generations, we are come up to produce a big old outstanding ear. Again, the tassel, I planted lots of sweet corn. In my, I've got a garden about as big as this building here down where I live now because I've always enjoyed farming and ranching. And I planted lots of sweet corn. And one morning here about three years ago, I've been around farming like I told you my whole life. And I've always known that if you go out and cut the tassels off, you're never going to have any kern, uh, kernels because that tassel, actually, when you see a tassel, I always see these little spikelets that covered up. Inside each one of those 
are thousands of spore cells, the male spore cells. And I never seen them before until one morning I was in that garden with that sweet corn and I happened to be looking back into the sun and I was watching this thing and you talking about neat, I didn't have a camera or video or nothing. They were bursting open like you see on TV with the high definition cameras. Those little spores up here in this tassel were, were popping open and it looked like powder, real fine powder just coming down and it was just, it was, everything was just right for pollination and that's where that little old fine powder was going to drop down and get on that silk. And each silk goes to a kernel and we're going to have good sweet corn. Sweet corn is a selection. Again, we do selection. They come up and through the years they found out this variety that tastes better or sweeter and it's nothing but sugar content. Well, you see, you say, why don't we all raise sweet corn and nothing else? Sweet corn is real tough shelf life. You buy that sweet corn when you eat it in a store or mama goes and gets it and buys it for you, two days usually is about all they can keep that stored. It takes a lot to labor because of such a fat content in that kernel or the sweets, it spoils. It'll spoil real quick. It gets what we call sour. And you get a sweet corn, let it sit on the counter for about three days and you open it up and you smell it. Don't bite into it. You'll, you'll smell it real quick. It just sours and that's not good for a hen. It, uh, like I said, it is sour. But uh, other corn, sometimes the field corn, which we ate growing up forever and ever before they started developing and selecting these sweet varieties, uh, you could last a week or two maybe, a week on some of them. They have some sweet corn varieties now through selection that, that will stay ripe and without getting over mature and hard, it'll stay on there for a week, a week and a half. That's super as far as marketing goes because it gives that farmer longer to uh, select that harvest and bring it to you at the stores. So they have to get it all there at one day and be gone and maybe lose some of them. He may be able to do it over a week now, a week and a half, and it stays very good. That's from selection, they developed those varieties. But they started with this little old thing and now we're up to these ears here and some of them corn ears now up where you get the growing environment. We're almost too far south to be in an ideal corn growing environment here. Corn doesn't like that much heat at the end. If it stays above 99 degrees for more than two days and this stuff's trying to pollinate, guess what? It can sterilize. Mm -hmm. If this sterilizes this head in the field and your pollen bursts open, it's sterile, and it goes down and hits that ear in the pollen, what's gonna happen? No kernels. No kernels. You're, you lost your whole crop for the year. So Mother Nature plays a big role in this natural selection. You know, everything's gotta be right. And we're almost too far south. And when we plant here, we got to get in the fields down here. Oh, that February, March is a real close encounter. That's a real close encounter. You got to gamble to get that corn in ahead of time. I've known lots of people to be planting always around San Antonio Stocks or some of these more progressive farmers that are chancing it. They got high land and low land. You know, there's two or three degrees difference. Y'all ever ride a bicycle out in the country road sometime in the evening in the fall, girls or guys, and you drop down in a hole, does it get colder or warmer? It gets cooler. You can feel that temperature. That's just how it stratifies in there. Well, that's all it takes on growing some of these crops too. You get a frost, it may be 33 degrees versus 30 degrees on one field, and you may lose that whole field if it hits it right and you plant it and it just comes up. So you got to be gamble a little bit, but get it in because of the heat later on. The main thing is the end growing period. Up north, you know, we don't worry about that. They worry about getting in on time up there. What did they say? They, another foot of snow last night to two feet. All of that corn belt. Well, it's really north of the corn belt country. They really get the snow. I guess it'd be a good place to visit now. So that would be that, that corn that you get in the stores in August is probably from Kansas or somewhere. Yes, sir. Not local. We went up, my wife and I toured, uh, we always, she was a history teacher around here and uh, she always wanted to see all the Continental 48. Well, we finished seeing all the Continental 48 states last year and you brought that up and it was kind of, I never thought of it, but we were up in Northern New York up there and uh, Vermont and their sweet corn, this is in October and their sweet corn was just coming in. Yeah. And I, I asked, stopped at one of the roadside and I said, was this your second crop? Meaning plant one crop and get it out and plant another. They said, oh no, this is the only one. And we're worried about getting it all in. I said, I would too, because it was some of that corn wasn't even silking out yet, and that was going to be another three weeks. I don't think they got it in that year. Corn's real susceptible to freezing at that stage too. It, it'll flat mess that pollen up and that uh, silk up on it when it freezes. It, plus the leaves, it, it, it'll kill it. So you got, there's a, 
medium there. So like I said, that was in October that we made that tour up there. We drove all through to see the pretty leaf changing and all that, but I wanted to see the crops and that. And it was very unique. But through selection, we come in from this little bitty one and we produce to get good ears. Let's go to the livestock here. Any of y'all have any cattle? Anybody in the family have cattle or whatever? Has a farm all that? You know what she raises? Pigs and chickens. Yes, sir. I have chickens, ducks, goats, and cats, birds. Cat? Yeah, we could select him too. Come on, different one. Yes, sir. Bunch of deer. They're doing lots of selecting now on deer, aren't they? Have y'all heard about, you know, they're breeding so many of the new genetics on deer farming now is one of the biggest things in Texas, or the United States, is actually selecting different bucks and doe lines to produce these monster bucks or whatever. But on genetics here real quick, it's just kind of like y'all sitting around this classroom. Any of y'all kind of sweet on little boys or girls or got a boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever? We all have a little bit different version in life of what we like, don't we? You know, if everybody liked the same old guy, girls, we ought to all be fighting over him and all the rest of these guys wouldn't have a chance. So there is difference on what you want. Selection, personal selection again. You look here, what is this old breed that Texas is noted for here? Longhorn. That's your longhorn. Anybody know what this one is? Probably the one that's got the most advertising out there in the whole beef industry is your Angus. Your, your certified Angus beef and that. Uh, tell you a quick little history there. We all know the old Longhorn. He had come over from years ago, and he naturally bred out in the wild for generations and generations. When we when they turned them loose, those uh, Spanish, when they brought them over in the old days, and they got through with them, bunches just ran wild, just like our pigs. That we're we're still seeing descendants of them wild hogs that are running wild, taking over the country yet that were turned loose generations and generations ago. But your Longhorn here, he's adapted. He's a survivor on his own. You know, uh, I can tell you right now, he's very heat tolerant, meaning he can stand the heat. Um, you cannot believe, and this, I don't think it's a good thing, how quick they can move them uh, horns on that sucker. He can shake that like Zorro, that tip that horn, and he'll flap an old cow yoke and almost kill him. I mean, it's unbelievable how quick they are. I mean, that, you can't even see it move. They're, they can hit that head so quick and use them horns like that and pop things, and they'll gore you with them too. But anyway, their beef though, is sir? Is that like a bull then? Uh huh. It's using its horns. Yep. That's now cows have horns too. That uh, that has nothing to do with the sex of an animal horns. You know, like deer, yes, in a few of the other wild game, but on cattle, they all can have, some breeds can have horns. Angus are naturally polled. I heard y'all already talked about that term, naturally polled. What is polled? Polled. You have, if you got an animal, it's either gonna be polled, meaning naturally hornless, or it's horned. One of the two, polled versus horned. It's gonna be one of them too. Which is dominant? Do y'all remember dominant and recessive? Have y'all heard those two terms? Yeah, I can look at you, I can see your dominant traits, you know, your hair color and your facial expressions. Yes? It would be the horns, right? What? On the dominant. Polled is, polled is dominant. P-O-L-L-E-D. P-O-L-L-E-D is dominant. That, uh, so you come in. Is this a cow or a bull? As we can look at physical features. This is definitely a bull. And this is definitely a young Angus heifer. If these two mated, let's get into some real selective terms again. On I'm selecting things now. I've got a longhorn. If your neighbor had a bunch of longhorn cattle he was so proud of, and you vice versa changed this around, and your Angus bull got in with them and mated with them, or whatever, which happens in a farm life, the trait polled is what? Dominant. What would all them calves come out as? Would they have horns or would they be polled? All the babies. If you had an Angus bull jump in that longhorn cow herd and bred them all, and they had 10 cows, they all had 10 calves. Through selected and genetics, polled is dominant, 
This is recessive. Every one of your calves are going to be polled. You think that longhorn breeder is going to be happy? No, he's probably wanting to keep that longhorns growing in his herd out there. One thing you need to know too for y'all for your selective breeding in the future of all of your farm animals, there's three dominant colors in all your farm animals. The number one dominant is what color? White. White is the top up here dominant color. You have white. Number two is black. Number three is that red or brown, whatever you like to call it. That's the dominant order of colors on animals. I don't care if it's a pig, a cow, or what. Those characteristics are going to come out dominant. So usually, and there's a difference. Some of y'all ever hear of the Charlet breed of cattle we imported from France? Many, many years ago, 60, 70 years ago, we brought the Charlet over. That's not a true white color. A true white, how many of y'all have ever heard of Hereford? We have had lots of Hereford cattle in this country. Hereford. Red with the white face, they always call them. You see them out in the pasture. Lots of your great grandparents, that, that's what they would have been raising in this country over the Herefords. That white face is white as white can get as far as a genetic white. That's going to breed true every time because of that white face. A Hampshire hog, any of y'all ever watch any friends around here in 4-HFA show them hogs? The black one with the white belt around it. You know, they got a breed of beef, uh, belted Galloway cattle the same way. They're the Orioles, they're black with a white belt all the way around them. That white belt's kind of dominant. They're not kind, it is. Sir? Okay. So we come in here. Hey, Longhorns, they're not going to have that good juicy meat. They've been survivors. They can get out and eat the sorriest old weeds and brush and whatever, and, and they'll survive on you. Angus, this one here naturally has been on a ration. You want a good quality meat in the United States, it's going to be <laughs> Angus. You will check now through selective breeding, and I can't stress this anymore, not because I raised registered Angus, but all the black breed of cattle you drive out in the country you see nowadays, all that black come from one animal, one breed, excuse me. But I promise you, I bet you not 10% of the cattle you see are Angus out there that are black. But through selection, they all like a little bit of that Angus blood in them. And black is the second dominant color, right? White's the only one above. And you come on in, and that's where it is. So we come on in. Angus, a very high-quality, palatable animal. And through selection, they have really developed this. One quick thing, too. This is above your head, probably. <clears throat> but the Angus people, some 50... 60 years ago, started with an EPD, expected progeny difference. Expected progeny difference. Big words meaning what? Somebody impressed me in here. EPD, expected progeny difference. Expected <laughs> progeny difference. Uh, You're trying to guess what her off what her baby's gonna look like, or how much her baby's gonna weigh, how docile. Angus people, like I said, for six, <coughs> excuse me, have been doing a tremendous job for 60 something years now, keeping records. And they can tell you now on these registered animals, in a, usually within about five pounds of what her calf's gonna weigh, depending on what bull you breed her to. Because they have record, if they got the EPDs on the bull too, they selectively made. I always, I would not purchase a bull without selecting. I select very strong on the EPDs. So what he's saying then is the, the, the farmers and ranchers that have been raising, uh, specifically the Angus, every baby that they have, when they get to full maturity, they've got a, a ton of data. They got tag mm -hmm. on the year, and they have, you know, weight, fat, cotton, all that. So when they go to slaughter, and now, after you've been doing that for that one line that you've got, you can pretty much say, this is what I'm getting. And so now if you want something a little bit different, you're looking at that whole history of data and you can start to be a little bit more zoned in on what you're going to get instead of just, well, let's try it. Yeah. And, and that gets to be an expensive deal because it's, yeah. you know, it's a couple hundred dollars just to get a decent calf, maybe not a thousand or more. Well, sell them now, yeah. Feed them and all that kind of stuff. Because you, you get semen from some of these high dollar bulls now that you can actually AI your cattle through selection now, a very quick way of 
<coughs> getting tremendous selection real quick. <coughs> it's through artificial insemination, and, and that semen is going to run you $30 a sample that you're getting the best. Maybe it's a tremendous bull over there where they come from. <coughs> Excuse me, there's something caught. When we get that Angus when he comes over from Scotland, and this is a tremendous bull, I can get semen over here for $30 and inseminate my cow, and I can have a, a $20,000 calf maybe on the ground or something like that. But you select what you want. It's just like I said, well, I go in that boyfriend-girlfriend situation. It's kind of what you want to select. It's a little bit different. That's why people have Hereford cattle <coughs> or your land race or your Yorkshires. Here's that hemp hog I was telling you about. You know, through selection, we change things up. And pig people, it seems like they're changing every six or eight years. They're going to change what they like. And, and people always say, well, they get to sell more breeding animals that way if the, if the trend changes. Hey, does this, this look like one of those old boyfriends or something here? Kind of ragged looking? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> really an old type animal here. Really an old Tamworth cross animal is what this is. And uh, <clears throat> nowadays, hey, when y'all's mama or grandma was around ladies, and I'll pick on, not pick on ladies, but cooking in the old days, what, what all did they cook with in the old, old days, grandma and great grandma? Did, when you cook something, did, did they have, what, what are some cooking things that your mom uses now, oils? Sunflower oil, what? What's the number one? Olive oil. Olive oil. We have all the different oils nowadays. This stuff was not around. Through selection of our plants, we developed these good oils. That was through selection also. But now, hey, in the old days, you had fat off that pig, commonly called lard. And about the only time I see lard nowadays making good uh, uh, tortillas and that shit, then use that good lard, is the fat layer all the way around that animal. Didn't have much meat, had good pork chops and that on it yet, but not big ones like we get nowadays on selective breeding. Look at this pig's top here. Can you see that crease coming over? They're like you're quicker, you're back. That's nothing but a big old loin eye sticking out there through selective breeding. We've got big loin eye, tremendous ham. But you don't want, you know, 17 pound ham is a big ham and <coughs> Sir? That's a long pig. Yeah, he, he's pretty. Oh, this one? No, it's the other one. The pink and brown one. This here is, I can't tell if it's a land race, but I'd say it's probably a Tamworth, I mean, a, 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 a land race cross. Land race are extremely long. And I would say that of all the park y'all get at HEB or whatever store you happen to shop at around here, guys or gals, I would say that uh, if you go back and check their mamas, that nearly all of them have some of this land race or Yorkshire blood in them. All the mamas are the number one commercial producer. Through selection, she will produce on average another pig or two. But here we have the old Berkshire. You can see the different styles. Depends on what they want. They change them up. Your bacon comes from this region, your ham from here, and your pork chops and all that up here. They select to get these types of different ones. In the old days, we had to have lard. We wanted sloppy, well, I shouldn't say sloppy, fat animals. But now we want meat. We'll go to these cleaner meat type of animals. Okay. Sir? What is GMO? Anybody know them big words again? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Genetically modified. You can look at chickens and we can... That can genetically modify. Let me start off first here before I turn anybody off. The last thing I heard this past week, there still has not, has not been any, any scientific data showing GMO to be bad for you or has any bad traits. There's nothing out there yet showing that. Even though in our World Trade Organization, we trade a lot of agricultural commodities worldwide. There's some countries that are starving over here, will not take our uh, chickens or, or especially our corn and wheat because it's genetically modified. I don't know what propaganda they have listened to and claimed, but there's, there is no scientific, scientific data out there proving anything's wrong with it. There isn't. I'll eat it all day long. It's kind of neat. We started out, I guess the first one I can think of, is, is a selective herbicide versus a non-selective herbicide. A selective herbicide will kill certain plants I spray. It won't kill them all. Non-selective. Through our GMO selection, our genetically modified, they came in on corn, soybeans, 
were the first two, because that's the biggest crops we grow in the United States. On corn and soybeans, they found out what gene in that plant is sucks in, takes that chemical in, it kills it. In other words, if I wanted to kill Johnson grass in, in my field of corn, I couldn't do it because Johnson grass and corn were so closely related, they're both in the grass family, I could not spray in there and just get one. It would wipe both of them out. You're defeating your purpose. But they took that corn and genetically researched it and they found that gene in there. We got some uh, unbelievable people in the agronomy world nowadays working on this and they found that gene. They said, here's that gene that sucks that chemical in. They took that gene out of that plant, and guess what? And researched it and sprayed it, it didn't kill it. Didn't change none of the corn quality, didn't change any of the wheat quality, didn't change any of the soybean quality. It just took that little bitty gene out of that cell, tiny, tiny cell, and now they can plant that out there and if that bad uh, weed or crop comes up, they can spray it. It doesn't hurt the crops at all, but it will take care of them weeds. That's the herbicide that was commonly used is called Roundup. So if you're just listening on, I don't know, you listen to Farmer Ranch Report, you'll hear they talk about Roundup Ready. Can you please so, so that so they can use that Roundup on and it will kill all the, the bad weeds that you don't want in there because those mm -hmm. are sucking up your water and your fertilizer to put down. Right. That, that dirt well, in old days, that's how we got. But real quick on what you're saying on a GMO, hey, they ran into problems now. Of if you knew something, especially a insecticide we got to watch out for in the agriculture industry and in our herbicide we got to watch out. If you use the same one year after year after year after year at the same dose, guess what? Mother Nature on her own will come up and she selectively builds up immunities to it somehow. And now we're getting problems with the what we call a careless weed down there. It's a red root uh, pigweed up north. It's, it's resistant to Roundup now they, they, because they use it so many years up there and they, they didn't alter. Well, that's why we're here, even when I spray on my cattle to get rid of flies, which get real bad down there in the heat of the year, I ever heard the term, I try to alter with a different chemical. You look at the ingredients always on the chemical, I select one totally different to get rid of my flies. Flies will build up immunities. Lots of insects will build up immunities. They're selective too, so I'm selective on my chemicals that I use. Chickens here, when, back when I was a youngster y'all's age probably, hey, that's how they were. Through selection, we picked up better roosters, a little, hey, I like that rooster, he's a little bit thicker, I'm gonna keep him back and put him in with my chicken herd next year, and I got this a year or two later. Then I got a bigger, uh, Hey, that's a bigger rooster yet. I sure like the way he is. I'm going to select him and put him on my better hens. One thing I need to throw at you real quick. We, we've really come in. That's where majority right there. The breast is 85% is of the whole carcass. And that's why if you ever watch any of the poultry show judges, he only handles that breast usually. He doesn't go to the drumsticks. Nothing to the wings. But you come in on selection on that chicken carcass. What is a pin feather? A pin feather? I'm going to go back to a question. A pin feather. What are they? Pin feathers. It's like a feather from a bird. Is it like a feather that's actually used as a pen? No, I like that, but no. A pin feather is, is a little bit opposite, but that's a good, good guess, though. Uh, uh, it's an immature feather, the one just coming out, a little, a little baby one, immature. And you look at, if you come in here and pluck this whole bird real quick, you can have pin feathers just that you can't see them. Every bird's got them. The feathers are always constantly growing a little bit. Especially on these young birds, when we consume them, the average one that your mama's going to eat nowadays, it's probably going to be about seven weeks old, believe it or not. And there'll be little pin feathers all over. And in the old days, before we started going, what, what about our dominant color? What's the most dominant color we have? What is the dominant color? White. White. Very good. White. I'm sorry, I got the... Uh... Oh. I'll take the smart board off so we can yep. things. But anyway, hey, that white feather, we got to have it because a lot of our chickens, what of our turkeys, our old broad-breasted bronze, the number one turkey in the whole world for generation when we were kids at the, they always shot, you see that color of the wild turkey? That's called bronze. If you pluck him, he's going to have little black spots all over. And your mama's going to walk up to that meat counter and look at that thing and say, I don't want that thing. He's got something wrong with him. Because you can actually see the little bit of black specks. That's just pin feathers, doesn't hurt nobody. And so we come on in and through selection, they've learned. 
A bronze is a dark black looking color. You take a white rooster and put on that whole herd of chickens or put a bunch of white roosters and you crossbreed that white and that bronze, what a color are your chicks gonna be? What's your dominant color? It means it's gonna show up every time. White's gonna over seed it always. White will cover those black pin feathers up, in other words. You follow me? It's not just partially, it doesn't blend in and make a cream. White's dominant over that. So it's gonna take care of all of that and then they, you can sell the same bird at the counter and it doesn't offend anybody. That's the reason we want selection. The meat's exactly the same. But we take that white rooster, we take them white toms, and we got to have them now. Some people, they like the, what they call the heritage toms or, or turkeys yet, but some get offended by that and most of them get offended, it's been proven. Okay. But here are the eggs the same way through selection. Hey, you select the better eggs, these people know which one laid it in there, and we got the different hens. I know this breed of chicken is going to make a bigger egg than this breed of chicken. I select that one and use it in my mating system, understand? Okay. And wheat the same way. I can walk out in any of my grass fields now, and I can show you different wild plants, wild plants yet, that are in these crested families. We call them crested wheat and that or whatever. There's not much seed at all, barely enough for a little bird to eat. And you got to really watch out for his thrones here. You know, uh, we come up with the new modern day wheat here. We've got wheat now that doesn't have any of the thrones on it. We can graze that with cattle further up. If you try to graze this and the seed gets in and cattle eat too much, it makes a little, it, it actually clogs them up inside. So they went ahead and bred the thrones off of it through selective breeding. They, they like to graze this, it makes excellent winter grazing. But we, through selection, they just saved the wheat and we progressively getting better and bigger seeds, fluffier seeds in there. And we have, oh, no telling how many different varieties of wheat nowadays. We got hard winter wheat and, and different ones. Again, why through selective breeding? If they, in the old days, if this was just growing out there and they just went out and harvested it, there'd be a lot of weeds mixed in with this field. I'm talking about many moons ago, okay? Long time ago. There were a few seeds and if you can pitch people going out and just picking them, they had to survive. That's all they had to do is gather food to stay alive. They didn't have to worry about watching 8 o'clock soap operas or anything. They had to survive first, and they'd walk out and start picking these seeds. Well, if they would chop some of the weeds out, they found out, and they put a little bit bigger perch underneath that maybe next year and they planted it, they would get a bigger head, and they'd save some of them seeds, and they would come on in, and we would progressively get up to a much, much better thing. They found out, too, if I spaced it maybe a little bit further apart and a little bit wider rows, Instead of so many seed together, you can take 10 of the best corn seeds in the world and if you plant them all in a circle that big and, and expect them to grow, what's going to happen? They're not going to do too well at all. They've got to have their space just like you got to have your space. They've got to have a space and usually probably about, a, you know, on rows, the average row down here in Texas we plant now is about a 36 inch row. And we probably have a corn crop about 8 to 10 inches. Every 8 to 10 inches in that row will have a seed. They've got to have space for sunlight, moisture, root absorption, and ex So we're going to have to wrap it up. Um, in just a minute, I'm going to let you thank Mr. Bassbein for coming in. Uh, he'll be here maybe for the, the second one, uh, so you might see him later. But these are some of the, this is a slide with some of the techniques you saw where they're doing some of this research. And so when I was asking you about, you know, you to do your selective breeding program, what was going to be your process? If you, if, I know from reading some of those this weekend, you really didn't go and look at some of these things, but you see here where this is actually, they've got one row, and they're bagging the, it looks like they're bagging the tassel. Yes, yeah, all of that's tasseling okay. up or keep it from hitting. And he's showing you how it's coming down, the, and then this looks like maybe this is some wheat there, and they're going in with, with forceps and tweezers in a greenhouse, trying to look at what properties they're getting. So they can continue the research. But yeah. uh, if you would, everyone, uh, thank our speaker for coming in today. And I know you'll learn a lot. Enjoy being here, guys.